As always, it's a privilege to get up here and preach once again. I would classify myself as a reluctant preacher, but I submit to the discipline of John Davis. Uh, John Davis puts me on the list, and since I can't beat him at arm wrestling, here I am. John is preaching at Feltonville today, and uh, will try to join us later for um, our lunch. I want to welcome everyone here today, especially our visitors, and I want to welcome my friends Lou Borda and Tracy Borda. Lou um, taught with for many years at Masterman, and the highlight of my day at Masterman would be having lunch with, with Lou. And if you've ever done any teaching, you know that the highlight is always lunch because what happens after lunch is never the most pleasant thing. It's usually downhill from there. But I thank them for coming. As most of you know, um, John's been doing this series from 1 Peter on the gospel-formed life. So I stole part of the title from, from his uh, titles. Uh, you know, his titles were the uh, pursuit of the gospel-formed life, the purpose of the gospel-formed life, the portrait, the promise. You get the idea. Everything starts with a P. And I thought about spelling focus with a PH, but I see that the printers didn't put that in there, so we'll go with F-O-C-U-S, the focus. I think they're wise. Our text for today comes from Paul's letter to the Colossians. And what I want to try to explain today is the focus of a gospel-formed life centers on our hope, the hope held out in the gospel, the hope laid up in heaven for us, and the focus of a gospel-formed life also centers on the absolute truth of the gospel, that firm foundation established by the early witness of the resurrected Christ. And thirdly, the focus of a gospel-formed life centers on our commitment to pray and to study the scriptures. Paul, in writing to the church at Colossae, is writing to folks who are living in a small and insignificant town located in the Lycos Valley in what is present-day Turkey. Back then, it was called Phrygia. Colossae was a small town that had a short lifespan, was non-existent by 400 AD. And I'm not sure if they've even been able to find the ruins yet. Located about 100 miles from the thriving port of Ephesus, Colossae was part of a trio of towns that included Laodicea and Heropolis. And it's only the church at Laodicea that gets mentioned in, uh, by the Apostle John as one of the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. And apparently Paul never made it to Colossae, but rather it was a disciple named Epaphras, who was the founder of the church there. Perhaps during Paul's three-year stay in Ephesus, Epaphras was converted and discipled by Paul as he taught in the hall of Tyrannus. One likely scenario to explain why Paul even wrote this letter is that Epaphras, out of grave concern, had come to Rome to visit Paul, a trip of over a thousand miles. And Epaphras pours out his heart to Paul, tells him that the people in his church are wonderful, they're, they're great, but that he's worried about them. There's trouble brewing because of false teachers. There's imminent danger due to heresy creeping into the lives and thoughts of the saints, teaching that might rob them of their joy in Christ. In an attempt to thwart the false doctrines, Epaphras will carry this letter from the great apostle back to Colossae and read it to his flock, a letter from none other than Paul. It's a word of warning, but also of encouragement. So let's see what Paul tells these Christians in this little backwater town that might resonate with us today. Let's look at our passage together. It's Colossians 1. We're starting from verse 3, reading to verse 14 in your Bibles. 
Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. If you don't have your Bible, it's right on the back of, the, of your bulletin. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. First, allow me to talk about the false teachings that the Colossians had been exposed to and that caused this dear fellow servant, this faithful minister, Epaphras, to travel all the way to Rome to meet with Paul to express his concerns. It's vital to understanding Paul's reason for writing this letter and for understanding what the believers at Colossae were up against, and even more importantly, for what we're up against today. The saints at Colossae were under attack, and so are we, competing ideas, ways of thinking, and philosophies which sound good, all vied for a place in the minds and hearts of first century believers, as they do among Christians today. The spiritual attack on the Colossians orchestrated by Satan seems to be threefold. First, there was the threat of their old pagan ways. Historians tell us that in this region of the world, many deities, including Artemis and Helios and Demeter, dominated the worship life of the people. There were oodles of small g gods. Remember how Paul got in trouble in Ephesus. In Acts 19, the silversmiths caused a riot because people were turning away from worshiping household gods and turning to Christ. People weren't buying as many of their silver replicas of Artemis. They were losing business. And the silversmiths blamed Paul, and they caused a riot and he barely escaped with his life. For the saints at Colossae, a relapse into the worship of these household gods was certainly a concern. The pull of their old life, their old ways of thinking about the world, and their old ways of relating to one another was always a threat, just as it is for us. But then there was also the attack through the infusion of Greek philosophy. Greek philosophy on one hand, and Jewish legalism and ceremonialism on the other. A philosophy that would make us believe Jesus plus knowledge equals salvation. And a legalism that preaches Jesus plus works equals salvation. Satan used and still uses this hodgepodge of false teachings to attack what he always attacks, and that is the sufficiency of Christ. And Paul aggressively counters throughout this letter, there is neither Jew nor Greek, circumcised or uncircumcised, but Christ is all. It has been said of Colossians 
that nowhere else in all of Paul's writings does Paul make such a strong case for the supremacy and sufficiency of Christ. Throughout the letter, Paul will make one thing clear. Jesus is the answer. You want knowledge. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You want to be accepted by God. Worship Christ, not angels. You want to fulfill God's will. Don't fool around with the shadow of empty rituals that will fade away. The substance is Christ. You want to be holy. Don't abuse your body. Set your affections on Christ. Paul has one thing in mind in writing to the Colossians, and he homers, hammers home this point over and over. Jesus is God, and Christ is sufficient. Christ is all and is in all. And salvation means Christ plus nothing. Too simple for the Greeks, a stumbling block for the Jews, and bad business for the craftsmen who tried to make a living selling household idols. This letter to the Colossians follows the pattern of most of Paul's letters. It's normal for Paul to start with a simple greeting and then go into a thanksgiving before launching into the main thrust of his message. The section we're looking at today may be labeled in your Bible as thanksgiving and prayer. And in his thanksgiving, Paul first gives thanks to God and then gives thanks for the qualities and characteristics that God has brought about in the people to whom Paul is writing. And here, Paul praises the Colossians, but is sure first to give credit where it is due. So let's look at these verses that come at the start of this great letter. In verses 4 and 5, we see three words that we often find mentioned by Paul. Faith, love, and hope. At the end of 1 Corinthians 13, Paul writes, And these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And we call this the love chapter, don't we? But here, Paul seems to give the priority to hope. First, he commends their faith, their faith in Christ. Then he commends their love. These Colossians are getting a good report then he reminds them that their faith and love are a result or because of the hope laid up for them in heaven. In the NIV, I think the language is even stronger. The faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven. It would seem that the faith and love of the Colossians is based on and dependent on the hope that they have. It's a hope that produces fountains and gushers of faith and love springing forth and producing fruit. And what is that hope? Their hope is the truth which has come to them, the word of the truth, the gospel. And it's a gospel they learned not from Paul, but from Epaphras. And their hope is not in vain because it's a hope laid up in heaven where neither moth nor rust can corrupt or thieves can break in and steal, a hope that is alive and active, an inheritance, as Peter puts it, that is imperishable and undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. For Christians, our values are so twisted compared to the rest of the world. The Christian says, I should say the rest of the world says, I want it now. Give it to me now. The Christian says, I don't want it now. I can wait. John MacArthur says that Christians are people who are willing to sacrifice the present on the altar of the future. A lot of folks don't want to hear that kind of talk. In fact, popular Christianity would have you believe that you can have your best life now. Why wait? God wants you to be happy, prosperous, and wealthy. 
now. Something that Peter and Dida said a few weeks back, that for the Christian, this life is as bad as it gets. But for the non-believer, this life is as good as it gets. Non-believing people, no matter what their present condition or circumstances, are having their best life now. I know this isn't a popular notion these days, but I want my pie in the sky. Critics of this emphasis might make the remark, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. Have you ever heard that expression? And there are many who would argue that the gospel has more to do with this life on earth than with life in heaven. That the gospel's focus should only be earth in the present as opposed to heaven in the future. They would argue for a gospel that provides direction for life here on earth. A gospel that transforms relationships on earth. A gospel that pursues social justice. But if we have hope for Christ only in this world, only in this life, then we are most to be pitied. Watching the movie Selma a few weeks back, I was struck by the fact that the evangelical church was conspicuously absent in its support of civil rights. And I still don't understand it. I'd like to study the history there some more. The church that seemed to have the best understanding of God's sovereignty and the highest view of scripture, the church with the best theology, the church that could, if it wanted to, make the strongest case that God shows no favoritism, wouldn't take a stand on the issues of voting rights back in 1965. And some could argue that there were some evangelical Christians who took a stand in opposition to full citizenship for African Americans. Maybe they thought it was a communist plot. So while Roman Catholic nuns and priests, Russian Orthodox bishops, pastors from liberal mainline churches, Jewish rabbis and Muslim imams put their lives on the line in solidarity with those who were trying to right a grievous wrong, evangelicals seemed strangely silent. I always wonder what would have happened if Billy Graham had linked arms with Martin Luther King. But shouldn't all Christians have known that the gospel is about the lordship of Christ over all of life now? That the gospel transcends even our old traditions, our ways of life. That it's not merely a way to escape the corruption of this world and go to heaven when you die. But... As troubled as I am, I'll take a drink here. As troubled as I am about the church's past failures, or it's being too slow to respond, and while I admit the gospel is concerned with this present life, I also have to acknowledge that the gospel is ultimately and primarily concerned with the hope that is laid up for us the real living that comes after death, and what is going on in heaven right now. Paul writes in the third chapter of Colossians, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, You also will appear with him in glory. I want to be that heavenly minded. I want my eyes to be fixed on that hope. Then I think I can be of use to my master, prepared for any good work in this life. The gospel is mostly concerned with the hope for what Christ has reserved for us in heaven and the glory of spending an eternity in his presence. And then in verse 5, we see the word truth and the word gospel aligned together. Funny how some people might use the expression, it's the gospel truth, even in a secular setting to emphasize the absolute and utter truthfulness of a statement. 
Someone who is less than credible or known as a liar might protest to his friends, no, this time I really am telling the truth, the gospel truth, believe me. And to say it's gospel is to say it's really true. And Paul wants to warn the Colossian saints and confirm to them that what they have received from Epaphras is the truth and not to be swayed by the claims of empty and hollow Greek philosophies or bullied by those who insist that they must follow old covenant Jewish rituals. The concept and nature of truth has always, even in the first century, been a matter of controversy and debate. Remember Pontius Pilate at Jesus' trial, derisively asking the question, what is truth? And it has not fared well in the hands of modern skeptics. Today, they would say one of three things. Some contend that absolute truth simply doesn't exist. Others say that if truth does exist, it's impossible to know. It's in inaccessible to the human mind. And the third position states that truth does exist and that we can know it, but only and always in a variety of forms in a degree of relativity, depending on the community in which you live. Truth for one group of people may not be truth for another. But we should know, and be, by now be convinced, that the consistent testimony of Scripture is that there is a truth that is absolute, and a truth that is accessible, and a truth that is universally relevant for all people everywhere, at all times, the truth found in the gospel of Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. We're not Christians because we have faith. We're Christians because we have faith in Christ. In verse 6, we read these words, the gospel which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, a truth relevant for all people everywhere at all times. For a kid from the suburbs of Pittsburgh, for a drug dealer from North Philly, for a little girl from South Street, for a young lady from the hills of Virginia, for students from Kenya, Nigeria, Botswana, Singapore, and South America, for city dwellers and farmers, and even for people from California. Indeed, in the whole world, the gospel is a message for you. It's personal ever so personal, but it's also universal. Jesus is mine, and yet he belongs to the whole world. Heresies and false teachings, those are local, ethnic, and culturized. But the gospel is a message for the whole world. It plays in Jerusalem and Rome and Ephesus, but not only there, but also in tiny little Colossae. It's not some local sect, some mystery religion from the East. There is truth found in the gospel of Jesus Christ, truth that is universal and truth that can be embraced with our minds. When we come to worship, we don't have to check our brain at the door. We don't have to rely simply on warm, fuzzy feeling down deep in our soul. There's nothing wrong with fuzzy feelings. I do want to feel God's presence in my emotions. But we don't have to depend on a subjective experience to confirm the truth of the gospel. Some of you, if you're old enough, may know the hymn, He Lives. And the last line of the chorus answers a question. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. Yes, I want him to live in my heart, that too. But I also want to know that he lives because the resurrected Christ appeared not only to Paul, but to the 12 and to the women and to over 500 people at one time, over a period of 40 days, some of whom weren't as yet dead at the time of Paul's writing this, though some had died. It's almost like Paul saying, if you want me to, I can give you their names and addresses Go check it out for yourself. 
And today, people are free to reject the witness of the resurrection. But you can't deny the fact that those early witnesses were convinced. And as the Apostle John writes, that which we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this is what we proclaim concerning the word of life. These believers weren't looking for a subjective experience that made them feel good. They weren't following a religion that somehow worked for them. And they very well may have felt Jesus in their heart, but they were convinced through hearing, seeing, and touching the risen Christ. And they were willing to die rather than to deny the truth. I, for one, am too skeptical. I don't have enough faith not to accept and believe their witness. Their faith in Christ went far beyond a feeling. It was based on the gospel truth. And you may ask, what is the centerpiece of this gospel truth? What is its content? And Paul lays out many of the essentials in what I think is one of the most important passages in the Bible. And I've already, already referred to it. It's in 1 Corinthians 15. Just want to read verses 3 and 4 there. Paul writes in, to the Corinthians, For I delivered to you as of first importance, what I have also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and rose again. This is our gospel. This is our good news. The word gospel means good news. It's from the Greek word eongelion. It's where we get our English word evangel, evangelism, and evangelical, good news. It started out as a technical term that was used in battle. In Greece, which was divided into various city-states, and these city-states were always fighting against each other, there would be a messenger who would run back to the city to deliver news from the battlefield. And the residents would look out and see the messenger coming. And they could tell from his expression whether the battle had been won or lost. And if he was smiling, then they knew they had won and then joy would fill the city and the messenger would cry out, we won, we won. And that word is eongelion, the good news, the news of victory. And that is our good news. It is the good news of the Colossian Christians. It's the news of victory. We who are saved have been delivered out of the bondage of Satan. And you may not have felt or sensed this bondage at the time. Perhaps those of you who have struggled with addiction may know it better. But for a lot of us, we thought of our lives as normal, not in terms of being held prisoner or being trapped or held captive. We never thought of this world as a prison camp. The world is just where we live. We did what everybody else was doing. Paul writes to the Ephesians, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. And that's because we wear our sinful nature so well. We are, we're blind and dead to the reality of our situation and dead to God. Desensitized to our own sins of self-centeredness and looking out for number one. And of course, why not? That is our normal and natural state, trying to justify ourselves and make ourselves look good or at least okay to ourselves and to others. We were dead in thinking about God. We were hiding from God, and we didn't even realize it, oblivious to the fact that we were held captive by Satan and enclosed by the gates of hell. It's what we at Grace Church have been trying to tell you. You're worse than you think you are, and that's bad news. But look at the good news of victory for the Colossians and us in verses 12 through 14. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you 
to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. I think here Paul tells us not only what the content of the gospel is, but what it means to us and what it does for us. That Christ has broken through the gates of hell and rescued us, delivered us, plucked us from the dominion and domain of darkness. John Piper writes in his book, God is the Gospel, and he compares the victory message of God's deliverance to being freed from a prison camp. This is the difference the news of Christ's victory makes. Christians have heard the news that Christ has come into the world and has fought the decisive battle to defeat Satan and death and sin and hell. The war will soon be over and there is no longer any doubt as to who will win. Christ will win and he will liberate all those who have put their hope in him. And then Piper continues, the good news is not that there is no pain or death or sin or hell. There is. The good news is that the king himself has come and those enemies have been defeated. And if we trust in what he has done and what he promises, we will escape the death sentence and see the glory of our liberator and live with him forever. This is not the kind of deliverance or release from prison we see in our criminal justice system today, where you serve your time, you get out, and then go back to the same surroundings and environment that led you to prison in the first place. Nor is it the kind of deliverance from bondage that was held out for the slaves with the Emancipation Proclamation or the signing of the 13th Amendment under Abraham Lincoln that promised equality for African Americans. That was on January 31st, 1865. God's deliverance is not a dream deferred. With Christ, not only are we released from the grasp of Satan, but we are brought into his marvelous light. We are transferred. And what an amazing transfer. Not free to the same old place, to some neutral location, or to some sort of purgatory, and left to fend for ourselves, but adopted as sons and daughters, welcomed into the family with a seat at the table. We have redemption now. We're like Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the grandson of King Saul, who after the death of King Saul and Jonathan had every right to expect that the new king would come to kill him and his family. But that's not what happened. Mephibosheth is given a seat at King David's, David's table for as long as he lives, not because of anything he had done, but because of David's great love for Jonathan. How much more do we have a seat at the great feast because of the Father's great love for his son Jesus and what he has accomplished for us? So faith, so focus on the hope laid up in heaven. Focus on the truth of the gospel. And in the last few minutes, I want to look quickly at how we can utilize and appropriate this gospel for ourselves, perhaps in a practical way. Starting in verse 9, Paul begins to pray for the Colossians, and it's interesting to note the pattern and content of his prayer. When we pray for people, do our prayers follow the pattern of Paul's prayer here? It's a pattern of petition and praise, a pattern of asking and thanking. And that's a good pattern. And what about the content? Do our prayers for others mostly show only concern for their circumstances or their physical needs, their health issues or emergencies? Yes, pray for those, but remember to pray for each other's spiritual needs. You go to some churches and the back page of the bulletin lists all the people are, who are in the hospital as if you have to get in the hospital to be worthy of prayer. And we may find ourselves spending more time praying people out of heaven while we neglect praying for them into heaven. A suggestion, use verses 9 through 14 as a pattern when you 
pray for others. And the very last point, Paul prays for the Colossians to be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Boy, that's a mouthful. It sounds so otherworldly and mysterious, doesn't it? How can we be filled with the knowledge of his will? Is that on some other spiritual plane? No, I, I think it's simple. Read your Bible. Just read the Bible. Get to know him through scripture. Read his words. Get to know his thoughts. Focus on prayer and Bible reading, and you will come to know his will. And out of that knowledge will flow a life worthy of the Lord, a gospel-formed life. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your beloved Son. Thank you for rescuing us and for qualifying us to share in the inheritance with all your saints in light. May we be filled with the knowledge of your will that we might walk in a manner that glorifies you, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. Amen.